Visitors from outer space crash land without warning and can lie buried for thousands of years. Oh my God! Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold live to unearth these space rocks. Let's go hunt. They're the meteorite men. Woo! Their quest is part science. Here's our first image. And part treasure hunt. That is the real thing. On this adventure, the meteorite men reveal secret maps. We don't show these to anyone. To solve a 160-year-old mystery of science, the landing site of one of the world's most famous meteorites, the Tucson Ring. Watch out for scorpions. He's right on my target. If they can find even a small piece of this mysterious space rock. Look at that! They'll become a part of meteorite lore. Definitely need to bag this one. And get rich beyond their wildest dreams. <laughs> this is the bumpiest road in the history of the world, officially. You know. Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern-day treasure hunters. They're in southern Arizona to solve one of the greatest of all meteorite mysteries. The Tucson Ring is the single greatest mystery and legend in meteorite lore. It's one of the most beautiful meteorites in existence. It's probably the most famous meteorite in the world. And it was found somewhere around here in a canyon that was unofficially named the Valley of Iron. That peak right in the middle, with, That's the, with, the, with the rocks on the top. Yep. The Tucson Ring is the holy grail for meteorite hunters. The 160-year-old mystery is no one knows where it was found. But legend says more pieces are out there. Finding even one would be worth a fortune. Coming off of one of these mountains with a piece of the Tucson meteorite is worth a lot more than a really big stack of money. But um, th this, is, this is the quest to solve the mystery more than it is about the money. You never say that. Uh, but it's true. Wow. Steve's decided on something that's one. more important than money. Just the one thing. Yeah, the one thing. That's so admirable. The site that we're going to is on the other side of this mountain range. It's really difficult to get to. It's some pretty spectacular scenery up there, and it's also really steep. Sometime in the 1850s, two giant iron meteorites were dragged out of these mountains. Today, at the Smithsonian Museum, they are the stars of the world's most fantastic meteorite collection. One is a 630-pounder named the Carlton Mass. The other is 1,400 pounds, the enigmatic Tucson Ring. Under a microscope, you can see what you might call meteorite DNA, small silicate inclusions. Like a fingerprint, the matching inclusions prove that these two pieces broke apart from a single mass. If one giant meteor exploded in the atmosphere over what's now Arizona, the breakup must have scattered many other pieces, creating a strewn field. When the rock would have come in, it would have been one piece. And then when it hits the atmosphere, it's a very violent occurrence with the rock, and it will break it up. The larger pieces will have more inertia, and they will go farther. And then the smaller pieces start to drop off, getting bigger and bigger. And then the larger one will end up hitting farther off. Here is everything that we have on this site. These mountains have been crawling with gold prospectors since the 1500s. So if there are these big irons lying somewhere in view, wouldn't one of these prospectors have stumbled across them in all these decades? It just adds to the mystery. We're in this area, assuming that guys with a couple of horses towing a rock that weighed almost 3 quarters of a ton couldn't have pulled it over these mountains. One of the things that interests me are all these steep canyons down here okay. on, the, on the west side and the south side. The best bit I have to show you are the secret maps. Jeff has a special map he inherited from his good friend and mentor, Professor Jim Cree. The professor inherited the map from a prospector known only as Leon. 
And these maps we are not showing to anyone because these three documents show all of the specific finds that yeah. Leon made. They're real treasure maps. They're almost priceless. The maps have been blurred to conceal the exact location of the marks. He actually, according to the stories I've heard, used one of those doodle bugs on a map wait, in the mountains. Wait. Did you say doodle bug? <laughs> I know that you don't exactly believe in this sort of stuff, but he used one of these little swinging doodle bug pendulums, and he would hold it over a map, and wherever the pendulum came to rest, he would go and hunt there. Wait, 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 <laughs> you brought me <laughs> to chase. No, no, it gets better. <laughs> okay. Believe okay. me, if that was just the story, we, we wouldn't be out here. He found irons up in the mountains. I've seen a couple of the pieces. It's not that big a leap to go, well, could those irons that Leon the Prospector found somehow be linked to the Tucson ring? This is what really interests me, and this is where we're going today. Okay. Get me there. <laughs> That's and exactly we'll where we're going. We'll see if he missed a couple. And we're, we're, we're down here. Here's okay. the track we're going to take. It goes up through here. It's as crazy as anything. Oh, yeah. Which is why we've got the rock count. Today's meteorite hunters don't go by horse or burrow. They go by hound, rock hound. It is a multi-purpose all-terrain vehicle. And when they say all terrain, they mean it. We can take it in the water. Not that there's a whole lot of it out here in Arizona. It's got tracks. It's got heavyweight rubber tires. So the tires are uh, cactus proof. I hope so. See, that's me. Right. Leon's map is marked with what he called hot spots places he once detected a lot of iron. And pieces of iron could be the best clues possible to finding the place where the Tucson ring was found 160 years ago. Jeff and Steve aim right for hotspot number one. The really intriguing part is the reports from the finders say that when they located these irons and removed them from the valley, they just took three of many, that there were other irons in the same valley or canyon, and they just took three that they thought would be useful for their purposes. They weren't even the biggest ones. I think that's about as far as we're going on this. Let's go hunt. The Valley of Iron, if it exists, is in country that can easily kill you. It's hot, dry, and home to some notorious wildlife. Rattlesnake country. Steve's got his uh, incredible snake-proof boots, but they're too hot and heavy for me. So we use the old-fashioned snake gators. They do work. I haven't died yet. They're ugly enough to scare off the snakes. <laughs> You're just jealous, because you don't have any. I'm not jealous. <laughs> I've got snake boots. If the rattlesnakes don't get you, the scorpions will. Don't forget the gloves. You don't want to get dirt under your fingernails. I know. Wouldn't it look awful? I should get my bag. I've got gloves in my bag, too, if I really need them. Oh, now you're going to wear gloves. No, only if I need them. Well, how do you know when you need them, when it's too late? Oh, I was bitten by a scorpion. I should probably start wearing gloves. Yes, that, that's, that's uh, right. <laughs> that's right. Do you think we should lock up the rock hound? Take the keys. It's not like there's anyone up here. Track log is on. Steve and Jeff rely on GPS to record where they are and precisely locate the position of anything they find. Look, Steve, there's no use pretending that you understand it any better than I do. I'm not trying to pretend. Evening, low 68 to 73. It talks! And two veggie burgers and an extra large fries, please. Hold the mayo. Jeff and Steve split up to cover as much terrain as they can as quickly as possible. We're very close to the Mexican border. Um, I've met rangers out here, and they've said, don't come down here on your own. It's not a bad idea to be armed if you're <laughs> in a small party. So uh, watch out for rattlesnakes and drug smugglers. Nothing yet. <gasps> Most meteorites have a high iron content, so metal detectors are the meteorite hunters stock in trade. That low sound when it growls like that, bah, bah, that means it's iron. 
and that's what we're looking for. Metal detectors work by emitting an electromagnetic field from a coil at the end of the wand. And then when a piece of ferrous metal encounters that zone under the coil, you get a signal. This isn't the metal detector your grandfather uses to find coins on the beach. This particular detector, it's smart enough to differentiate between iron foil, nickel, zinc, dimes, quarters. And so that would be a very strong signal. We know we want to dig there. But Steve and Jeff also rely on a thoroughly low-tech trick to pick hidden bits of iron from dirt and rocks. They attach powerful rare earth magnets to the heads of their field picks. When they dig, the magnets attract anything that contains iron, be it meteor right from space or earthbound meteor wrong. Just a little piece of wire. But it was iron, said it was iron. It's neat. Somewhere in these mountains and canyons, those gorgeous big irons were found. And there have to be other pieces somewhere. The payoff would just be enormous. It would be the biggest feather in our caps that we could possibly come up with, I think. Financially, if, if Jeff found it, it would be priceless, because he would never sell it. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if I found it, uh, th then we have to do a little bit of supply and demand calculation. It's worth looking for. <laughs> and it's more than the financial. Um, it's, it, it's the quest. It's the final unwritten chapter to one of the best stories in meteoritics. How do you put a price on that? Not long into their search of hotspot number one on the secret maps, Jeff gets a hit. That sounded like something. Well, that's definitely a target. Is it a piece of the famed Tucson ring? A clue to the legendary mystery? Look at that. Oh, wow. It's the back of a cartridge, but a big one, like a armor-piercing or anti-tank round. I think, look at that. That would have been a big shell. All right, onward. A little boot thingy. Another meteor wrong. When we pick up a target with a detector and we get all excited and we dig down and we find that it's not, in fact, a meteorite, we call it a meteor wrong. And that's a really bad one. It doesn't even look like a meteor. This must have been a deer stand. Nice. The prize is so big that it's, it's worth going through the, the meteor wrongs to find the meteorite. Check this out. Well, I think you should dig it. In the meteorite world, size really doesn't matter. Ow. Discovering even a small meteorite paired to the Tucson ring would be a scientific wonder and a financial windfall. Oh, oh, another hit. A big staple. Woohoo! Another miss. Another letdown. Jeff and Steve have a lot of money and their reputations riding on this expedition. Huh. A belt buckle. All the media wrongs. And then I found this can of tobacco. Make and, it uh, tough for Jeff to stay optimistic. Yes. Okay, this is driving me nuts. Somebody else has been here. Steve's a very good influence on me because he's very good-natured and positive, and he thinks there's always a meteorite just on the other side of that hill, whereas sometimes I go, there are no meteorites left in the entire world. It's a waste of time. God, there's a lot of trash down here. I don't even know what that is. Piece of an old can. That looks like an aircraft part. It's a bullet. Oh, come on. What's your secret? Well, you just you make the most of the daylight, and you try to get as much covered as you can in a day. Don't you ever get fed up? Um, no. <laughs> Stop being so reasonable. <laughs> Holy cow. It's a clip of live ammo. That's not something you see lying around every day. As far as media wrongs go, that's one of the more interesting ones. I found plenty of old spent bullets and cartridges, but I've uh, never found a clip of live ammo before.
coming up here onto the side of this mountain where this long deceased prospector apparently found some iron. <laughs> it's kind of a long shot, but you don't find anything by staying at home. The first search area was the number one hotspot marked on the old prospector's secret map. So far, the targets are turning out to be iron, but only terrestrial iron, possibly from an old testing ground. So we found uh, tin can, uh, aluminum aircraft part. We don't I found know. one, too. Aluminum aircraft part, aircraft part. Uh, this is very cool. We think this is part of a anti-aircraft shell or something. A old sardine can, a belt buckle. Um, a, I don't know what that is. What's discouraging is this old prospector 20 years ago <laughs> may, <laughs> have, <laughs> may have discovered an old bombing range. Jeff and Steve are left wondering, is the Valley of Iron for real? Or were Leon's finds all meteor wrongs? The, the story that I've been told from a reliable source is that a couple of pieces were sent to an assay lab and they came back very high in nickel. And to the best of my knowledge, they didn't put nickel in artillery shells. They were almost definitely meteorites. The presence of nickel is what separates the iron found in meteorites from terrestrial iron. Why nickel? Before the Earth cooled, nickel iron sank to the Earth's core. Any nickel iron on the surface rusted away over time. In space, iron won't rust because there's no oxygen. So with very few exceptions, any iron found on the Earth that has nickel fell from space. Convinced that the old prospector's finds were real, Jeff and Steve continue their hunt. There's got to be some more pieces of the Tucson meteorite. Well, I thought it might be a good idea to let Steve drive the rock hound on the way back. Whoa! Uh-oh. I broke it. And um, within the first minute, he blew the tire out. I mean, not even a minute. What it, what it boils down to, really, is that Steve's a maniac, and he should not be allowed to drive any expensive equipment. Allegedly, <laughs> Allegedly. the tire popped. Um, you got a AAA card for your M. <laughs> I do, Phibious actually, vehicle. I, I don't think that they cover tracked vehicles <laughs> on non-paved roads in the middle of the mountains in Arizona. The Tucson Ring is a huge iron meteorite that was dragged out of these mountains around 1850. Even then, at 1,400 pounds, with a hole in the middle, the ring was priceless as an anvil. It was dragged first to Tubac, which is a small town south of here, probably by horses or oxen, and then later into the town of Tucson, where it was used as an anvil in the old Presidio. It was half buried in the sand in the old Presidio, and they used to beat iron on it. And then after a number of years, it was recognized as a meteorite, and it lived at the Smithsonian ever since. It's very unusual to see a large hole in a large meteorite. It's possible that as it flew through the atmosphere, creating atmospheric pressure and generating tremendous heat, the middle just melted and burned right out. There may have been a softer inclusion, such as a large piece of carbon, or something softer than the iron that melted at a low temperature. Another possibility is, after it landed on Earth, moisture accumulated in the iron, and there are documented cases of terrestrial weathering causing holes or large scoops to form in iron meteorites. Terrestrial weathering caused that hole slowly to form. Also known as rusting. Yeah, could have just rusted away. <laughs> the Tucson ring is rare for more reasons than just its shape. All meteorites are one of three types, stone, iron, or stony iron. Irons are the rarest of the three. Only one in seven meteorites is iron. Even among the irons, the Tucson ring is in a class all its own. Not only is it a beautiful piece, it's a very unusual type of iron. It's, it's an anomalous iron meteorite. It's so unusual it doesn't even have its own class. So you combine the beauty of the piece with its unusual makeup and the mystery of its find, it, it becomes a pretty interesting detective story. It's interesting to me that Leon found a lot of stuff down kind of in the lower okay. ground. Okay. 
After one day, all Steve and Jeff have so far are a bucket full of meteor wrongs. But they decide not to abandon Leon's maps and focus on another area that the old prospector had marked. We know for a fact that things have been found. What we don't know 100% for a fact is whether or not they were meteorites, but the evidence is really strong. Jeff's late mentor, Professor Cree, also had these maps, and he also searched. But he, too, kept a meteorite hunter's code of silence. Jim was not prone to exaggeration. He thought there was something interesting going up here on this mountaintop, and the only reason he didn't tell us about it while he was still alive is because he was sworn to secrecy. If it works for him, it might work for us, they too. They are where we find them. That's right. Let's find them. They pick up their hunt at the second hotspot marked on the maps. OK, Jeff, before we get started, let's just get our bearings. This is the road we came in on. And yesterday, we, we hunted in this area here. I would just say, let's work our way around up on the slope and then work our way back up by the end of the day. Steve, he's, he's what I would call a, a speed searcher. He's a strong, tough guy, and he's got a short attention span, and uh, he likes to just cover as much ground as he possibly can. Ow. Oh. Good thing I don't need that eye. I'm a little bit more on the kind of existential side. Yeah, he, he paces himself, and he's a little more methodical. And, and that's OK. That's OK. I, I get in a kind of a trance, and I'm detecting, and I go, oh, I think there might be something over there. Or, no, it's that way. And meanwhile, he's going, Vroom! he's just tearing across the plane. And sometimes, communication leaves a little bit to be desired. I said, I, I think we should head south and go up onto this slope. And I look up, and there he is, way the heck up there on the top of a mountain. Jeff! And he'd gone west, not south. Southwest? I said, go south! Steve! Hey! What you doing up there? Looking, Looking for, for meteorites! What direction is that? It's uphill. <laughs> Did you find anything? No, no I'm, I'm not, not singing. singing. I said south. Too late. Steve and Jeff have vast stretches of land to cover before nightfall. The mountain range is not huge. It's not the Rockies, but it's big. There ought to be a lot of small pieces somewhere. And so the big prize is 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 pounds, which there could be bigger pieces than what are known of the two remaining Tucson specimens. No matter how badly they want to keep hunting, they have to be careful out here because they're not alone. Just earlier today, we, took, we stopped and we were taking a breather. Look out, Steve, guys, look. Look, is that a bear? And there's a brown bear scampering across the mountain. It's the first wild bear I've ever seen in Arizona. Almost ran over a rattlesnake driving home last night. Yeah. We stopped and helped him across the road, because we don't believe it. He did. He wanted to drive over it. I don't believe in interfering with the wildlife. That would have made a good hat band. Day two was feeling a lot like day one. It's more of that aluminum. Then, three hours into the hunt, with temperatures close to 110 degrees. Hey, got something here. And it's right there on top. Right there. Cool. It is the first find of the hunt. Wow. Now, that doesn't look like shrapnel. This looks really promising. And it's, it's, it's all iron. I mean, it's, it sticks to the magnet. Steve bags the possible meteorite for safekeeping and marks the GPS coordinates to pinpoint its location. It's iron. It looks like a meteorite. But only testing for nickel in the lab will determine if it is a space rock. I wonder if this is a piece of the Tucson ring. 
this up here nice and safe. Button it up so it won't fall out. A short distance away, Jeff works another prime area on the old prospector's map. That sounds good. It's right on the surface. Even after hundreds of years, meteorites that fall here tend to stay on the surface because the desert terrain is as hard as pavement. Ooh. Wow. Find number two, less than a mile from Steve's first find. Yet another indicator that they could finally be inside a meteorite strewn field, possibly even the Tucson Rings strewn field. Look at what I found. What, just now? Uh, a quarter mile away, maybe? They can't be 100% sure their finds are meteorites, but it looks like the secret maps have led the guys to a hot spot. If it turns out that this small iron is paired with the Tucson ring, it's a huge discovery. Oh, thanks. On the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> Now they believe Leon was on to something. Oh! With two finds bagged, hot spot number two looks like it's panning out. Here it is! Find number three. Look at that. These things might be related. Um, and hopefully from something very, very old, not something just a little bit old. Definitely need to bag this one. Thanks to a dead man's treasure map, Jeff and Steve may well be on their way to meteorite fame and fortune. I got something. That's encouraging. Is hot spot number two the Valley of Iron? The site where the Tucson ring hit Earth? We're enmeshed in, in a great mystery here of almost mythic proportions. Discovering even a tiny piece would be big news. Oh. The gold medal would be to find a bigger piece. Silver medal would be to find a little piece. The bronze medal is finding a new meteorite that's not related, but it's a new find. And these maps, we are not showing to anyone. Jeff's secret maps have led him to a location somewhere in the mountains of southern Arizona, near the border of Mexico. After finding pounds of meteor wrongs at the first location, their luck has changed at the second hotspot. Oh, look at that! Oh, my God! OK, he's not happy. No, he's not. <laughs> we'll just shoo him away. Shoo, shoo, little guy. No, leave, leave him. Uh -oh. Leave him? There's a meteorite down there. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there it is. It's tiny. Find number four. If it's a meteorite, this tiny piece could be worth more than its weight in gold. If it's a piece of the Tucson ring, it could be priceless. Where's that scorpion now? Let's give him some space. Don't you step on that. <laughs> I saw that. Oops. Stop looking at it. Go stand over there. <laughs> it's not that I'm a huge fan of scorpions, but there's no need to kill them. Well, that's pretty exciting. As small as they are, these fragments could give Jeff and Steve a place in meteorite lore, but only if they're confirmed as relatives of the Tucson ring. Today, it's perhaps the most famous and enigmatic meteorite in the world, this gorgeous giant ring. Steve and Jeff now have four pieces they think are meteorites, all found in hotspot number two. And there are still two hotspots to be searched. If the guys make discoveries in these locations, they'll be able to connect the dots and show the outline of a strewn field. And that, in turn, could point the way to the missing pieces of the Tucson ring. Hotspot number three is on the other side of private land. One thing Leon's map doesn't show is who owns the land, and that creates a problem. The guys play it safe before crossing the land of ranch owner Joe Robinson and introduce themselves. There's some really dandy stuff here that I found over the time. I don't know what it is. It turns out Joe likes to hunt for meteorites. Terrestrial. Very rare, I'm sure. <laughs> Terrestrial, though. 
this was my big find at one time, but I... Wow. And the, in these parts, you're looking for something that would be solid iron, so it would be the density of a sledgehammer. Steve and Jeff are happy to cash in on their common bond, and with nothing but a stick and a magnet. And then we're just going to tape a powerful magnet onto the end of it. That's good. I there is your real that. frontier you. rustic magnet cane. Hey, that's pretty neat. And with Joe's new magnet stick, the guys buy their way across his land. Don't mind. We're going to do a little hunting. And if we find anything, you'll be the first to know. Well, I appreciate <laughs> that. And you can go right ahead and go, go do her. If the Tucson ring strewn field is here, it's spread across rugged Arizona mountains. This search can only be done on foot in 100 degree plus heat. Today we're going to be at about 5,500 feet. It's going to be hot. Unfortunately, we've got no cloud cover. The altitude combined with the dry air will, will, will pull moisture out of your body really fast. Are we there yet? We've got to hike down this wash up there a ways. And then we'll mark the exact spot where Leon, the old prospector, discovered one or more irons. 315, emergency water break. Even though it seems like it's a lifetime away from, from up there, it's only a couple of miles in a straight line. Fancy meeting you up here. Being out in the boonies with uh, your hunting partner, looking for rocks from space, it's, it's a pretty interesting way to spend the day. And it's an adventure. And, and if, it was, if it was always easy, it, it would, there wouldn't be any memories with that. I got a target. What you got? Sounds like iron. Here, why don't you do the honors? Still there? So that was it. Smash that bullet. Oh, well. Thanks for digging that up for me there. Oh, don't mention it. It's the least I can do for you. You're a real good prospector. Hours of searching turns up nothing remotely resembling a rare iron meteorite. You don't find a meteorite every day, or sometimes not even every week. They try to keep their spirits up. It helps to maintain a positive attitude. And I think we get through some of the hardships and difficulty and disappointment by joking and goofing around. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, could I ask you to step over into the uh, security inspection room, please, before you board the aircraft? I was in the war. It was a, it's a steel plate in my buttocks. There, of course, is always the hope in your heart that that next target's going to be something really amazing. But on the other hand, you can just say, well, yeah, if you can't hack it, then stay home and watch television. Despite the heat, Jeff and Steve trudge miles up a canyon they finally arrive at hotspot number three, right where Leon marked a key find on the secret maps. From here, they can map out a possible Tucson ring strewn field. So this is it right here. In this little subwash uh -huh. is where Leon found the biggest of his pieces. Steve marks their present location. We are logged in and compares it to the coordinates of hotspot number two where they found the four small pieces right now we are 1.4 miles away in his computer steve plots a course between the two hotspots the area in between maps out a possible tucson ring strewn field that's the area to hunt next and it runs us uh, right up over the hill i would have thought we were further south well that's why we do it this way Yes. Because if I guess, we go and walk in the wrong part of the desert and die. Well, yeah, but it's all for a good cause. <laughs> That's where I want to be. One mile straight up. If the heat or the snakes don't get them first. I can feel the meteorites pulling me psychically. Or maybe it's just sunstroke. The guys could be on their way to becoming the most famous and wealthiest meteorite hunters ever. That might be something. Any pieces they find here could lead the guys to where big pieces of the Tucson ring landed untold years ago. That might be something. 
something. Yeah. Okay, I lost it. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's hard. Sometimes it's expensive and dangerous and frustrating. But the payoff is potentially huge. There, it ends right there. Hey, Jeff, there's something down there. Do some more thing. Maybe we should bring in the backhoe. I don't think we need to get a backhoe out of here. Look, it's like charcoal. Maybe it's a Look. lightning strike. Oh. Why would charcoal set off a metal detector? Yeah. It is that stuff, right? Hold on. Steve thought it might possibly have been a lightning strike. Ah, there's loads of lightning up here, mate. Loads of it. Thanks for calling me over for that. I really appreciate it. Shut up. You don't find a meteorite every day, or sometimes not even every week. On the other hand, if we found a meteorite out here, an iron meteorite, but it's not part of the Tucson ring, in a way, it's even more intriguing. Meteorites are very rare. Iron meteorites are very, very, very rare. The possible strewn field between hotspots two and three comes up dry. They find nothing. Jeff and Steve need help. So they turn to Warren Lazar, who knew Leon, the old prospector. This is where you used to mine for gold nuggets back in the 80s. This is it. Well, we didn't call them gold nuggets back then. <laughs> we call them, uh, you know, raw gold. Uh, we started this operation back in uh, 83 with my uh, friend Leon. But Le Leon also was, uh, he was a metal detector person. And he had found irons. You came here looking for gold. Found gold. <laughs> found gold. Yeah. And then your, your gold prospecting partner maybe discovered meteorites by accident at the same time. Good possibility. He said, well, I found this target. I, I think it's iron. Or I found this target. I think it's gold. And he'd never come right out and say it, you know, so I'd look A at it. A cautious man. <laughs> yeah, he's very <laughs> cautious. Now, you said that Leon had found some, some pieces. He had said that he had found what he thought was pieces of iron back up on this ridge. OK. Where's the Valley of Meteorites? <laughs> He's quite certain it's just over that hill, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Armed with new insight, Steve and Jeff head back to what they hope is the strewn field. So far, the guys have four possible space rocks to take to the lab for testing. They have one last spot on the secret map left to search. Hotspot number four, their last shot at finding any more possible pieces of the legendary meteorite. Well, that's something. Uh, yeah, a piece of an old can. Nothing yet. Steve! Jeff, I got one! Oh, my God. I've got one. I don't see anything. If this is a piece of the Tucson ring, the value would be astronomical. Ooh. Take a photo, a couple of photos of it. That is the real thing. We log the position with the GPS. And that is so we are able to record the exact find position. Looks like a little flying saucer. Well, I don't need to do the magnet test, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's what makes it all worthwhile. Find number five. Could it be a fragment of the Tucson ring? Oh, uh, mine's a meteor wrong. You want to see something cool? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Jeff. We need to test that one. Oh, yeah. If it's a meteorite, that's great. If it's connected to the Tucson ring, 
would be one of the biggest discoveries of our career. There's only one way to verify that Jeff's new find and the other four are actually meteorites. We think they're meteorites. We think, but we can't tell for sure without an analysis conducted by an academic specialist. They have five chances at matching the legendary Tucson ring. Five chances at cashing in on a meteoritic fortune. Their finds will be tested by meteorite specialist, Dr. Lawrence Garvey. Fortunately for us, the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University is just up the road. Hello, Steve. Hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you again, Lawrence. Oh, it's quite a big piece this time. Can I take it out of the bag? Yeah, please do. Oh. First thing to do is, is to polish a small window on this, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we can have a look on the scanning electron microscope and see what we can see. To do that, the would-be meteorite has to be ground, a nightmare scenario for a passionate collector like Jeff. I can't bear to look. <laughs> the scanning electron microscope has approximately 250 times the resolution of a normal light microscope. And so by examining these fragments, once they've been cut and polished, under the SEM, the scanning electron microscope, we're going to know for sure what they really are. So that's all you're doing on that? You're not taking off anymore? No, that's it. That should be enough. Okay, I can breathe now. The next step is to do some chemical analysis. It can go into the SEM with an EDX. Okay. The SEM, scanning electron microscope, provides an image of the physical structure. The EDX, energy dispersive X-ray, quantifies the actual elements the specimen contains and displays them as spikes on a graph. All the sophisticated equipment focuses on answering one question. Did the guys find a piece of the world's most fascinating meteorite? Well, the Tucson iron is probably one of the most enigmatic meteorites in existence. Structurally, texturally, and mineralogically, it's one of the most unique meteorites ever. No other meteorite even approaches its composition and structure. OK, we're going to put in sample number one. First up, find number one, Steve's most exciting find. This looks really promising, and it's, it's, it's all iron. Okay. They're looking for nickel, the element that is abundant in iron meteorites. So we've just loaded it in the microscope. Um, here's our first image. If they find nickel, Steve and Jeff may have discovered a piece of the Tucson ring. Yeah, right there. So we'll collect the spectrum. The results could make them meteorite rock stars. So these are the x-ray peaks that are coming up. Hey, is that nickel? We have our iron, our iron, and no nickel. No nickel. Zero. Okay. Zero nickel. Zero nickel. If there was any nickel, you would get a peak. We get a peak. We don't get a peak. Nothing. There's no nickel. No nickel. OK. What is it? Piece of iron. Oh, OK. One down. Four specimens to go. We're just holding our breath, waiting to find out. Let's do it. Find number two, one of Jeff's finds, is next. It's right on the surface. Check this out. And we've got to collect the image. That's obvious. There's no nickel. We don't get a peak. Again, no nickel. Another meteor wrong. I am remaining optimistic. The next specimen. Find number three. Here it is. Look at that. Uh, it has no nickel in it. It's iron. It's pure iron. Just a bit of steel. More junk. Just two more shots at fame and fortune. Find number four. Look at that. Oh, my god. OK, he's not happy. No, he's not. <laughs> We've got to change the magnification up here. You're, you're taunting us a little bit. It's essentially iron. Pure iron, certainly a terrestrial piece of iron. Nothing but another earth rock. The results are devastating. Hours and hours of hunting in extreme heat, and they have nothing to show for it. Steve and Jeff are down to their final chance. Find number five from the last search area. Look at that. We need to test that one. Oh, yeah. Right now, he's just focusing and aligning the microscope. So these are the x-ray peaks that are coming up. OK. Um, Look at that, nickel and iron. <laughs> 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 oh, this 
This one's iron. We have 93 atom percent iron and 7 atom percent nickel. It actually looks like an iron meteorite. OK, that was about a month's work <laughs> to find that guy. Okay. So we're really onto something. I guess the one we're one we're really onto something. One of those false yeah. inclusion. Now, the biggest test of their meteorite hunting careers. Does find number five Beautiful. match the Tucson ring? Now we get to wait until we get that test done. Pairing the meteorite to the Tucson irons rests on examining the physical structure of the meteorite. Seen through an optical microscope, the Tucson irons have an abundance of what are called small silicate inclusions. They appear clear or white. Jeff's new meteorite has none. You can tell immediately just by looking at this that this is unlikely a Tucson iron piece. It does not have the abundant silicate inclusions. No inclusions. It's not a part of the ring, but it's a part of space. It's part of the asteroid belt. There is some good news with the bad. Dr. Garvey's analysis reveals something unexpected. This iron cannot be paired with any other meteorite. It's one of a kind from a previously undiscovered fall. A very big deal in the world of meteorite hunting. It's quite amazing to find a new iron. It's really, really rare, as you both know. I mean, people can hunt their whole lives and not find a new iron. So it's quite, it's quite an amazing find. I look forward to seeing more of it. At auction, this meteorite might go for $100 a gram, making it worth more than twice its weight in gold. But for Jeff, the fact that it is a new iron puts its value off the uh. charts. We found a new meteorite. The expedition was a success. We're going back. If you add up all the hours it took to find this one and divide it by how many grams, it's a very expensive meteorite just in what it took to find the one piece. Maybe in some perfect universe, the mystery of the Tucson ring and the mystery of Leon's maps will join on the road and we'll finally get to the bottom of all of this. But the legend and the mystery of the ring continues. Still out there somewhere.